He teaches us things we didn't know. My guest tonight is a nuclear radiation expert, author and lecturer. Our show will focus on man-made nuclear pollution and its permanent effects on health for generations to come, engendered by faulty, exploding, leaking nuclear power stations, the now extensive and deliberate poisoning of target populations and our troops, with the use of so-called depleted uranium munitions, and even, it is now rumoured, enriched uranium-235, anti-personnel munitions. We'll also reveal the intensive media cover-ups which serve only to protect the military-industrial complex and be prepared to learn about the bitter harvest we have sown for generation after generation and what you can do to protect you and yours. This is one expert whose globally recognised academic qualifications, peer-reviewed papers and expert witness testimony in court mark him out as a man whose deep knowledge of the subject cannot reasonably be challenged. Knowledge gained here might one day even save your life as you take one step beyond with my guest, Professor Dr. Christopher Busby. Uh, welcome. Hello. I've just uh, performed a strange operation on my computer here. Um, so, you're an expert on nuclear radiation. And health. And health. Uh, explain how you became such. Well, by accident, really. Um, I, what happened was that I was living in Wales shortly after the Chernobyl accident and uh, I was out fishing and, and I, I got rained on um, and shortly after that we were told that there was quite a lot of radioactivity in Wales and I had already been a bit concerned about radioactivity in, in an earlier existence where I, when I, in the 60s as we all were then concerned about the possibility that there might be a, a, an all-out nuclear war so we, le we learned a little bit about it then in order to protect ourselves. Um, I was trained as a physical chemist, and so I was fairly reasonably uh, able to understand the, the, the background uh, to all of this. And shortly after that, uh, I became, in Wales, concerned about the way in which the government continually was saying that the radioactivity from Chernobyl couldn't harm anybody. Uh, and we heard at roundabout that time we'd, we'd heard that there were increases in childhood leukemia near the nuclear site in Sellafield mm -hmm. and uh, the government was also saying, uh, following various uh, um, advice from, sci from nuclear industry scientists, that the, 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 the childhood leukemia cluster at Sellafield couldn't possibly be caused by the radiation from Sellafield. Now to me that seemed totally counter counterintuitive, it seemed insane that, that we know that childhood leukemia is caused by radi radiation exposure and here we have the largest uh, operating site producing radioactivity and uh, the children living there have high levels of leukemia and it was somehow to believe that the, the, the thing isn't connected so I started to look into it and that's when I first walked into this quicksand which is the science of radiation risk. I can tell you it's a very complicated business it yeah. involves a lot of subjects. And you're now an expert witness in cases? Oh yes I win cases. I won cases, uh, several cases against the British government involving nuclear test uh, veterans and also in the United States, where, where quite large amounts of money are involved, people have been exposed. So these nuclear test veterans, well, there's Christmas Island and places like This sort of thing, yeah, Maralinga, Christmas Island, what, what Australia happened? Australia, uh, yeah, that's sure. Maralinga, is it? Maralinga, is in, yeah, the, the earlier tests were done in Australia, and then later on when they were making the huge, the huge bombs, the, the, the megaton bombs, they shifted the operation to Christmas Island. And of course a lot of poor squaddies, national servicemen, went out there to help. And, or so uh, they thought. Well, well, they didn't really know what was ha what was happening. They, they just had to go where they were sent, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so later on, of course, they all started to suffer from, from cancer and other sorts of ill health. And in fact, as I found doing a study on these people, their children suffered from high levels of congenital malformation, which is also something that radiation produces. So, so yeah, so that, so I did these cases for these nuclear test veterans. Yeah, sure. And you won them? Yes. So far, I've won every single one. <laughs> How many have there been? Um, about 10, I suppose, that I've won, and there's 16 to go. I mean, the Ministry of Defence got really, really upset about the fact that I kept winning them one after another. So, that, so sometime last year, they put all of the remaining 16 into a bag and decided to have them all in one go. Well, like a class action. Uh, kind of, kind of like that, yeah. But I think they didn't want, they didn't, you see, it's quite easy to prove, where you've got only one veteran and you can take that particular case, you can focus on what happened to that person. 
and you can create a, a reasonably good uh, expert witness statement which you can defend. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have 16 of them in a bag, it's really much more difficult to do. And so the Treasury solicitor had to, uh, tried to have me thrown out as an expert witness, but he didn't succeed. So, so I'm still on the case, and the case should be heard now. The idea is it's been heard sometime early next year, mm. the, okay. with the 16. The other but can, you, can the 16 not object and say, well, actually, we want to be... I did say all this. I said it was quite ridiculous. And then, interestingly enough, also, in, 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 with regard to this case, is I've been ha we've been having great difficulty in getting any evidence out of the Ministry of Defence. They, they, a lot of this stuff is kept secret, yeah. all of these records. Because, of course, you know, the case is about whether somebody's been exposed or not, right? So you would think in a normal action that you would be allowed to demand documentation to say, well, they've measured, you know, what, what they've measured at Christmas Island and all that, but they keep it secret, you see. But what you're in your previous ten cases... Yeah, in, the, in those cases I, I still won without knowing this stuff. I managed to get enough evidence together to show that, 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 that these people had been exposed. And the key, the, the key point is that the, the government believed they weren't exposed because they, they, have, they used to wear film badges which is like a little badge with the photographic film. And it would fog uh, and, if, and, it was, and, if there was radiation. radiation. Yes, exactly. And so by the amount of fogging, you can tell how much radiation they got, you see. But the trouble is it only works for gamma radiation. And, the, and as I figured out quite early on, the problem is not the gamma radiation. The problem is the internal inhaled and ingested radiation from alpha emitters like plutonium and uranium. After all, the bombs were made of uranium. But nobody ever mentions the amount of uranium that was involved. Each bomb was about one ton of uranium. So when it goes bang, you know, uranium goes everywhere. And as we know from the Gulf War, uranium is a very serious mutant. It's genetic. Yes. Well, it's well, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, but I mean, let's just wrap up the, 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 the legal cases that you're fighting then. So you've got some evidence. I mean, obviously they're not denying that they had nuclear explosions on. No, they're just saying that the doses that these people received were too low to cause any effect. That's what they say. But do you not know how the kilotonnage or, or <coughs> yeah, we know how much the size of the explosion? We, we know the size of the explosion is how many megatons and whatnot. But the, the, the point is what they say is that the, the bombs were exploded in the air above Christmas Island when the wind was blowing away from the island. And so very little stuff actually fell on the island. Um, but, but what they measured on the island was mostly with gamma, gamma, gamma um, Geiger counters. You see, and in those days, the Geiger counters were really quite primitive. They couldn't measure these alpha and beta emitters. Um, and the other thing which we now discovered as a result of getting a load of evidence, secret evidence out, you know, with a lot of fighting, is that the wind, although it was blowing off the offshore from the island at the time of the explosions, the jet stream was blowing in the opposite direction. So as the big mushroom cloud went up, it drifted off across the island, away from it, and then it hit the jet stream and it was brought back onto the island again, you see. So there are lots of big questions. So it would have fallen as... So it would have fallen back as, as, as these little radioactive particles of uranium mixed in with all the cesium and all the other stuff that these bombs make. So these guys got quite... And in fact, they had lots of evidence of this, you know. But we, we are, in the study that I did, they gave, they gave a, an account of how they all had nosebleeds and they had rashes on their faces and their skin and they had a lot of diarrhea and hair fell out and all this sort of stuff. But of course, it was not at the time. It was not listened to. And if they, if these servicemen went home, had children, yeah. some of whom were born with conditions similar to those of people who've been exposed to radiation, right? Can they sue the government? Have they sued the government? They haven't sued the government, and, they, and the answer is they can. They certainly can, and they could. But whether they will or not, I mean, a lot of them are very old now. But the children could maybe sue the that's government. What I was, that's what I'm yeah, saying. The could, could the children sue the government? I think probably they could. I think, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not very terribly up in, in, in the law, but it seems to me that it is a tort. You know, Which is harm, isn't yeah, it? A harm. It is a harm. So, you yeah. know, so they have been harmed as a result of something that the government did to their parents. And therefore, they should be able to get compensation for that. And is it likely that they would have deformed children? Yes. Well, I, well, I mean, there's not, no question of likely. We know that that is the case. Because I, I did a study of the British nuclear test veterans in 2007. Um, and uh, we looked at their children and the grandchildren. Now, to my astonishment, what we found is that although the, chi the, the children had about an eight or nine-fold excess uh, risk of congenital disease, compared to the, the normal level that you find in Europe. But also the grandchildren had the same level. So it wasn't exactly the same. Exactly, it wasn't yeah. declining. Well, in fact, it, it was ninefold in the children and eightfold in the grandchildren. So within statistical range, that's the same level. You know. 
And that was quite surprising because people tend to think of genetic, like Mendel, you know, like the sweet peas and all that. They think that, you, you know, if you, if you marry somebody, then you get a half, and then they marry somebody and you get a quarter and all that stuff. Yes. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't. No. So you've got... We know that it doesn't work like that because in the last 10, 15 years, they've made discoveries of, uh, of, of a mechanism called genomic instability as a result of looking at the Chernobyl effects. Okay. And what they find is that if you, if you irradiate the parent, what you can get is, a, is a, it's like a switch. It's called genomic instability. And the switch is thrown, not in everybody, but in, in a good proportion of people, uh, as a sort of evolutionary, uh, uh, evolutionary mechanism to get around a genetic stress. And what it does is it sends a message to the DNA to scramble. So what happens is that what used to be thought is like you would introduce, if you got some radiation, it would introduce genetic lesion X. And then, you know, the child would then have X, and then the grandchild would have X, so the genes go down like that. But it doesn't work like that. The way it works is you introduce genetic lesion SOS, and what that does is it makes the next generation just scramble. So you get X, Y, Z, P, Q, R, and so on. And, 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 that, and that SOS signal then goes to the following generation and it's so on. It's like sort of putting a wooden spoon in the mix, isn't it? It kind of is. It's, it's, uh, and, and, the, and the reason they believe that it happens is because it's an environmental, it's, it's an evolutionary advantage to a population. It's not an advantage to an individual, but for the population, if they scramble all the genes, then, they, then, then what happens is that they hope that one set of genes will be able to get through. That's, but if they're going to keep scrambling, though, even if you get one good set through, one, like a new adaptation, something that's useful, like, I don't know, the ability to breathe underwater. Yes, yes, sure, yeah, sure. Well, you might, scrambling. but then it'll keep yeah. scrambling. So the person who can breathe underwater, they might have a child that can't breathe underwater. Of course, that's possible. I mean, but, but, but all I can tell you is that this is what has been discovered, and, and certainly this, this signal has been passed across the generation in, okay. in, in through, through many generations. So you might think, or the people watching might think, that this is something that happened uh, quite a long time ago in the 50s. Yeah. And the 60s, I think? Well, mostly the big, the big, the, the Christmas Island test around 57, 58. Okay. Yeah. But also, but it's happening today, isn't it? With Oh, of course. With our troops sure, sure, in yeah. Bosnia, well, well, our, our troops well, in right. Afghanistan, also, Iraq, yeah. Libya. Yeah, this is also uranium, you see. I think uranium is the great missing secret substance, myself. I, I, what I, do you mean it's a great well, missing? The, the, because, because, you see, if you measure... The, the British government measures radioactivity around nuclear sites, and they measure radioactivity um, as a result of weapons fallout. You know? so, so when we look at all the paperwork associated with these court cases, you will be able to read... Uh, of measurements of cesium-137 and, and strontium-90 and a whole range of, of, of very exotic radioactive substances, ruthenium, rhodium, all sorts of peculiar stuff, iodines and so on. But what nobody ever mentions is uranium. But actually in terms of the total mass of material, and when the bomb goes bang, uranium is nearly all of it, nearly all of it. Not plutonium. No, well, there, were, there, were, there are plutonium bombs, but, but there's, there's, the, the amount of plutonium is a lot less than the amount of uranium, because they use uranium as a sort of reflector. The idea is you have to constrain the, the, the fission or the fusion inside a little sphere, otherwise the, as it blows apart you lose the critical mass. Yeah, yeah, that's right, so you have to keep it all in one place, and to do that you put an enormous great lump of uranium around it, so when it goes bang, all that uranium in the, in the bomb, is turned into these little nanoparticles, so it's the same stuff that you get in Iraq. Uranium acts like a sort of safe that everything's locked in. That's correct, yeah, sure. Okay, and that's what, that's what of course, is this mutagenic... And, and it's the, I think it's the uranium that is, that, is, that is actually the main problem, because uranium binds to DNA, you see, it's chemically, it, binds, it has a very high affinity for DNA. Uh, okay, and what, the other radioactive elements don't... No, they don't. No, no, strontium-90 does, but the others don't. Yeah. And strontium-90 isn't that common? Strontium-90 is also a, 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 a fallout component, yeah, sure. And we think that strontium-90 is probably the main cause of the, of the um, global cancer epidemic, which began in 1978 or 79. That was a consequence of the strontium-90 in the milk and in the people. I mean, we can, we, they've measured it in the people, they've measured it in the bones and the teeth and so on. Where, where's that, in the UK? Yeah. Where, where did that come from, then? It came from the global weapons testing from Kazakhstan, from Nevada, from Christmas Island, that the, the force of these explosions knocks it all up into the stratosphere, and then it gets into the stratospheric circulation, and it slowly comes down, and then when it rains, it rains out, and gets into the ground, and the cows eat it, gets into the milk, you drink it, gets into your bones. Wow. Well, okay. you, for sure. Okay, we're going to go for a break now. I want to learn more.